Hello everyone, FPR Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video, we'll be going through my Game Week 34 Complete Wildcard Guide. As you guys will know if you've watched the channel for a while now, I am wildcarding in Game Week 34, which means I've been giving this a lot of thought already. But even if you're not wildcarding, hopefully this video will still be useful for you. If you are enjoying the content here on this channel, please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. But without further ado, let's jump to today's video. Guys, before we jump into today's video, I just want to give a massive shout out to Ultimate Champions who continue to sponsor the videos here on this channel. As I said, Ultimate Champions is now live, so you can play this finally. We've been talking about it all season. The game is finally live. The beta is coming out very soon as well, but the first link in the description will take you to the alpha. As you join, you get to pick your first team, and they've also given you some free tokens as well, so you can open some packs too. So you can basically get the full experience of playing the game, build up those teams, and enter your team before the upcoming game week. At the moment, it's focused on sort of championship, few French league teams, few Scottish teams as well, but you can get on there, build your team, open your packs, trade with friends as well, and like I said, eventually you will have the opportunity to earn quite a bit of money with this game by selling these rare cards or these NFTs on the market. So link in the description to take you to their alpha. The other link in the description will take you to their Discord server too. So join the game, Join the Discord server. If you do join the game, let me know what you think of it down below. So I assume this is going to be a pretty long video because I've created a lot of graphics for this. And like I said, because I am wildcarding, I've of course given this more thought than a random wildcard guide that I've put together when I'm not wildcarding. So I'm going to do the chapters as I usually do. All of the chapters will be down, down below. So skip to the section that you want to skip to and hopefully you'll find some use in this video somewhere. The thing that I thought I'd start with is essentially the teams to target slash fixtures that we've got coming up and what we should be looking at for sort of the bulk or basis of our wild card. And I think this will answer a few questions off the bat. So what I've done is I've separated this into five teams that I think should form the bulk of your wild card because they are brilliant teams, as you would expect, the sort of the top five teams in the Premier League at the moment. And outside of that, they've got some good fixtures and doubles as well. And the bottom three teams are teams that both double in 36 and double in 37. So just a quick reminder, apart from obviously a double in 34 for Chelsea and Manchester United now, 36 and 37 are the two remaining doubles for the season. And they're the two big doubles as well, 36 being the biggest. For those of you that don't have a free hit left, it is essential for me that you start thinking about players from the teams that double in both 36 and 37, because you're saving yourself a transfer. So even if you're not wildcarding, I would do that. And if you are wildcarding, and again, you don't have a free hit left, as I'm doing, right? I'm wildcarding in 34. I don't have a free hit left. I think it's essential to try and target teams that both double in 36 and double in 37. So putting all that together, the five teams, again, very obvious, but I will go through them each individually. The five teams that I think are worth targeting for the bulk of your wildcard are City, Liverpool, Chelsea, Tottenham, and Arsenal. Now, I have put Tottenham and Arsenal on there because they both double in 36, and they have decent fixtures outside of that, and they're both fighting for fourth along with Manchester United as well. However, for me and my wildcards, as we'll discuss at the end when I go through some wildcard drafts, for me, it's Manchester City, Liverpool and Chelsea that I'd be targeting. And in particular, City and Liverpool because they're battling for the title at the moment. Chelsea, yes, they have the double this week, which is great. And a really good double in the 36 and great fixtures. But they've almost nailed down that third spot. They only need a couple more, sort of two or three more wins. And again, if Tottenham and Arsenal, Manchester United miss out on any points again, then they've pretty much nailed down third. And I think therefore we might see a little bit more rotation. With Manchester City... They've got fantastic fixtures. However, it is worth noting we don't know exactly when their double game week will be. So it might be that at the time of you watching this, because we're expecting to know this week, it might be that you already know where that Wolves fixture is gone. I've put it into 37 for now because Ben Krillin, if you don't already follow him over on Twitter, do go follow Ben over on Twitter. He seems to think that due to TV scheduling, it's slightly more likely to go into game weeks 37. But James from Planet FPL podcast basically said that it's a 50-50 shot. That fixture is going to either go into 36 or 37. There's a space for it. I think it's on the Wednesday night of game week 36. There's also a space for it on the Thursday, I believe, of game week 37. So there's two spaces for it. It could go into either. Hopefully we should find out before the game week 34 deadline. But I would be having probably at least two Manchester City players on your on your wildcard, regardless of when that double is, and potentially even three options again, which we'll discuss later on in the video. For Liverpool, again, in my opinion, I don't think you can leave Salah out of a wildcard. If you're looking at underlying statistics, Salah is absolutely still top of the league, showing excellent, excellent underlying 
baseline data. And I also think he's probably the best captaincy option in maybe four of the final five weeks. And you could at least captain him in every single week. So we're going to discuss at the end of the video. I think you could go for only one premium being Salah because you could captain him every single week. He's got a decent double in 36. And outside of that, the fixtures really aren't that bad. Everton, Newcastle, Southampton and Wolves. So again, I think you should be on for at least probably two or three Liverpool. And then the same again for Chelsea, even though they've got the issues with rotation because they've got so many players to choose from. And of course, they're pretty much now down third. They can't go out, get second. I still think it's probably worth having a Chelsea defender and a Chelsea midfielder at the very least on your wild card. They are, of course, alongside Manchester United, the only team to double in 34. So again, there's, it seems strange to wild card in 34 and to not have at least two or three Chelsea players. And then with Spurs and Arsenal, like I said, I don't have an issue with Spurs and Arsenal players. And I'll probably have at least one of maybe each or just one in combination between these two. But when I'm looking at what you can gain with the 34 wildcard in comparison to those that aren't wildcarding, most people that aren't wildcarding are likely on a triple Arsenal and probably double Spurs. I would say if you're watching this now and you don't have your wildcard, I think you've probably got five from Spurs and Arsenal. Now, Spurs' next two fixtures are really nice against Brentford and Leicester, but their double's really tricky in 36 against Liverpool away and Arsenal at home, and then they finish the season well. Arsenal's pretty basically the opposite. So the next two are actually quite tough for Arsenal against Manchester United and West Ham. Both defences are leaking goals a little bit at the moment, but I wouldn't necessarily back Arsenal. They seem to have some problems of their own at the moment, scoring goals and conceding goals. The double's not terrible, but again, it's got one fixture against Tottenham in there, the other one against Leeds, and then they finish the season relatively strong against Newcastle and Everton. So when I'm looking at opportunity to gain over those around me that aren't wildcarding, I'm thinking maybe if I load up on City and Chelsea who people are less likely to have assets from and maybe go for a double or triple Liverpool and then maybe take out a couple of Tottenham and Arsenal players. I'm thinking maybe that's the best way to go with the wild card. I'm not saying you should differentiate just for the sake of it, but I think you can go without Saka if you want to. You can definitely go out without Ramsdown Arsenal defence. You can definitely drop one of Son and Kane if you want to, or maybe just go for Kulisevsky midfield. So I don't mind Spurs and Arsenal, but again, I do see the opportunity there with a wildcard 34 to drop a couple of them at least and instead load up on City, Liverpool and Chelsea. So those are the five teams that I think should form the bulk of your wildcard. I'm thinking between eight and 10 players from those five teams, in my personal opinion. Most of them have stuff to play for and they've also got the best assets in the game with really good underlying statistics and then you've got the three teams at the bottom Everton, Aston Villa and Leicester these three teams all double in 36 and also double in 37 so again if you've got a free hit and you're planning on free hitting in 36 or free hitting in 37 maybe these teams aren't as much of a priority for you but again I've only got the bench boost left after my wildcard so I'm probably bench boosting 36 but that means if I can get players from teams that double in both I'm saving myself transfers that when I get to game week 37, I'm not scrambling to get these players in. Everton, the issue with Everton that you've got is number one, Everton aren't very good, but number two, the next two fixtures for Everton are very tricky. So Liverpool away and Chelsea at home really aren't the best fixtures. So I don't think you can probably get away with going for more than two Everton players because you're going to want to bench them for both of those weeks. And then if you choose other players with some tricky fixtures, such as a Watford striker, have also got Manchester City in game week 34, it starts to become quite difficult where you're wildcarding, but your team looks pretty crap for game week 34 and 35. So that's something you need to consider as well. But outside of that, I would say that probably they have the best four fixtures in 36 and 37. Leicester, Watford, Brentford and Palace. They are four really nice fixtures for Everton. So again, on my wildcard drafts, I'm going with probably at least one or two Everton players. Aston Villa are great because they have two fantastic fixtures in 34 and 35 and then doubles back to back in 36 and 37. Of course, they have a tricky fixture in 38. But again, as long as you're not going for a triple up, you should be fine. So I'm eyeing up people like Matty Cash. Phil Cun Philip Coutinho, also Ollie Watkins as well. Those three are definitely on my on my radar for teams that I want to target for thir um, for thirty four wildcard. And then finishing with Leicester, we spoke about Leicester last week. The issue that I've got with Leicester is that they are going to focus all of their attention on the Europa Conference League. So I think we might see quite a lot of rotation. Their semi-final is straddled either side of game week 35. So I think we'll see rotation in 35, but also potentially going into 36. And then as I said in that video, the final, if they get to the final, is three days after game week 38. So it might potentially be that we even see rotation in 38. So I'm less keen on loading up on Leicester players, but I definitely think you can go for a couple in your team. So hopefully that was nice and simple for you for the teams to target. Having a bit of a think about the fixtures as, as well. Like I said, that City fixture, it will be nice to know where that goes in. For me, I'm going to have at least one or two City players regardless of where that goes. But for those of you that maybe have a free hit left and are planning on free hitting in 37, if the double go does go into 37, it might be that you want less City players. Or if it goes into 36, maybe you want more City players, etc. So it's something you need to think about for sure. 
I, I personally think, like I said, City, Liverpool and Chelsea are the three teams for me that I'd be loading up on. And then I'd be a sprinkling of Spurs, Arsenal, Everton, Villa and Leicester. And then, of course, a few other teams have some good players in there as well. Let's move on to the next section. So the premium defenders this year have been on and off, but a lot of them have been very consistent. And I think going into the back end of the season when a lot of these teams have stuff to play for and a lot of these defenders are putting up underlying statistics of elite sort of attackers, I think a lot of us are going to want at least three or four premium defenders moving forward. That being said, for almost every team, there is a debate between the most expensive option and a slightly cheaper option. So for for example, for Manchester City, you've got, could you potentially downgrade from £7.1 million Cancelo to £5.9 million Laporte? You're saving £1.2 million. And for Chelsea, it's can you potentially, rather than going for Reese James at 6.3, do you go for Rudiger at slightly cheaper at 6.2? Or can you drop all the way to Alonso at 5.5? And then the same for Liverpool. Again, do you go for Trent? Or do you go to Robertson, even maybe Van Dijk if you want to? So I think for each of those top three teams that we've looked at, City, Chelsea and Liverpool, I think you can either go for the most expensive or you can drop down slightly. And I wanted to basically assess all of these premium defenders and look at who do I think are the best options. And for each of those teams, which is the most sensible downgrade? So if you want to downgrade one of those, either Trent, Cancelo or James, if you can't afford all three, which is the most obvious place to to, to downgrade for that team. So starting with Alonso and sort of Rudiger and Reese James, you can see here. Reese James definitely has the best underlying statistics from the three Chelsea defenders. So he's looking at, so minutes per expected goal involvement is essentially letting you know how many minutes it takes for them to accumulate an expected goal involvement. So we want that number to be as low as possible, right? So just as an example, Kane, Son, Bruno, Ronaldo, they're sitting about 120 minutes per expected goal involvement. So Reese James at 221 is very, very good. And you can see Rudiger's is 628. So yes, Rudiger is pretty good for safety of starts. Yes, he'll get those clean sheets and he's not bad for bonus and he does have a goal in him. But when you're looking at that, you're looking at it takes Rudiger three times the amount of minutes to rack up the amount of expected goal involvement that Reese James does. And he'll probably play more minutes than Reese James, but he's probably not going to play that many more minutes. And I think that when you look at how close they are in price, I don't think it's worth going for Rudiger for safety of starts when Reese James is as good as he is. Now, the issue that we've got with Reese James is that quite recently he's played two fixtures, one against Real Madrid to basically match up against Vinicius Jr. And then one against Crystal Palace in the semi-final of the FA Cup. He's played at right centre-back. Now, I've spoken to a few Chelsea fans. They seem to think that that is only when the left forward has quite a lot of pace and they can't play Chalobah or they don't want to play Chalobah. And also, as Azpilicueta probably wouldn't have the pace to match them. So I expect Rhys James to slot back into right wing back very soon. Maybe not for every fixture, but for most fixtures. So for me, the long and short of it is Rhys James is definitely worth the money over Rudiger. Whether he's worth the money over Alonso is actually a tighter decision for me. So he's 0 0.8 million pound more than Alonso. You can see Alonso is actually sitting at 363.6 minutes per expected goal involvement, which is actually pretty decent. It sort of matches up quite closely to Robertson. And he's, of course, 5.5 million pound. Now, the issue that you've got, as you can see, by him having the lowest projected points on this list here is that he definitely isn't nailed. But I would argue that Rhys James isn't nailed either. And if Chelsea stick with the back five, he is the only natural left wing back they have. Whereas with... The right-hand side, of course, Azpilicueta is very, very functional at right wing-back. Again, he's more of a right-back than a right wing-back, but he can definitely play that, as we've seen on a few occasions. They can even put the likes of Pulisic, Callum Hudson-Odoi when they're fit in that position as well. So I would argue that Rhys James actually has more competition than Alonso. Now, if I had to predict who would start and who would play more minutes, I do think Rhys James will edge him. But when you look at the underlying stats being fairly close, and when you look at saving 0 0.8 million... I wouldn't hate it if someone told me they were going for Alonso, especially with Reese James occasionally filling in at right centre back. For me, though, Reese James is worth the money, and I wouldn't be going for any of these over Reese James. I would be tempted by a double up or a triple up alongside Reese James. Where I think is probably the closest battle between two players, and again, if you go over to the likes of FPL Review and Fantasy Football Fix, this is where the smallest gap is, is between Laporte and Cancelo. So if you're looking, and I, you, you know, I can't afford Rhys James, Cancelo, and Trent, I can't afford all of these premium def defenders, FPL Review actually recommends in the ideal wildcard draft. So if you plug in the optimal draft with roughly what my team value is for a bench boost in 36, they actually suggest going for Laporte over Cancelo. Now it's worth noting Cancelo's underlying data is better. So 295 0.9 minutes per expected goal involvement versus Laporte's 465. But Laporte 465 really isn't bad for a centre-back. That's one of the best in the Premier League for centre-backs over the season. And he does have pretty good goal threat. 
The issue that you've got with Laporte, of course, is that Diaz and Stones are now fit. Diaz is now back. Stones, obviously, has been playing quite well. Stones can play at right back, obviously, if Walker is injured long term. Stones can play there. But I think there could be a little bit of rotation, whereas Cancelo is just going to look like he's going to start every game. Cancelo started every game pretty much this season. The fact that they're playing for the title, I think Cancelo will continue to start every game. So... In my opinion, if there is a downgrade you want to make from the premium option at each of these three teams, it is Cancelo to Laporte. But again, for me, at the moment, it's more so Laporte alongside Cancelo as opposed to in instead of. But again, I'm trying to let you know if you can save any money where you can. And for me, that would be the spot to do so, which basically leaves us with Trent versus Robertson. Robertson's data is not as good as I thought it was going to be. I was actually slightly disappointed when I looked at it. It's not bad at all. And it is one of the best in, in the league for, for defenders, of course. But for 7.3 million... 354 minutes per expected goal involvement. He is projected to get slightly more points than Cancelo. He's also got slightly higher expected minutes, that should be said. I personally think that it's not worth the £1.1 million saving on Trent. I think you should probably still go with Trent if you possibly can. Once again, I think Robertson's a good addition to Trent. What I would say about all of these comparisons and trying to project what's going to happen in five game weeks is five game weeks is a very small sample size. Trying to predict who's going to score more points over five weeks is impossible. Take, for example, I know I keep using this example, but Ivan Tony a few weeks back, when he scored five goals in two weeks, it just shows you that over a short period, anything can happen in FPL and football. When, when it becomes quite useful trying to project points and predict is over a season, we can get quite close and quite accurate. We can say accurately, Trent is probably going to outscore Robertson across the entire season. But across five weeks, if Robertson gets a couple of cheeky assists from corners or something like that, he could easily outscore Trent. So I don't mind any of these downgrades if you can't quite stretch to the most premium option. But what I've done is if I had to pick four, assuming you want to go for four premiums and one cheapy, or maybe you just want to play a 4-4-2 or a 4-5-1 moving forward, for me, it would be Trent Cancelo James. I think they're still worth the money, in my personal opinion, plus Laporte. If you can't quite afford that, I think Trent Cancelo, Laporte, and Alonso, basically switching out Cancelo for Alonso, I think you'd still get away with that then. You're covering most of the clean sheets with Laporte. You're still getting Reese James and Trent in there as well. For me, the two most essential players are Trent and Reese James. Like I said, I still I want Cancelo. Cancelo is going to be on my wildcard 100%, but I do think you can downgrade him for Laporte. Let me know down below. If you're on your wildcard, what does your current defense look like? We'll look at some drafts in a bit. If you're not on wildcard, how do you plan to get to as many of these as possible? Or are you just sticking with the guys you've got? So because Chelsea beat Crystal Palace in the FA Cup semi-final, Chelsea will be having a double game week in 34 alongside Manchester United. Manchester United obviously don't look great at the moment anyway, but also their double game week isn't that fantastic. So I think if you don't own Manchester United players, I'm not sure I'd be going for them on your wildcard. There's definitely justification to maybe like start with a Ronaldo or a Bruno and then switch to a Son or Kane if you want to. But the double's not great. I don't really trust them against either of those two teams that they're playing. So for me, I'm probably going to be going without Manchester United. So really it comes down to Chelsea. And again, I think a lot of us will own one of James, Alonso or Rudiger. Maybe you've only got one spot in the midfield for either Mount or Havertz. I'll be honest, my latest wildcard draft has both of these in. So I think they're both fantastic options. But what I wanted to discuss is if I had to pick one, who would I pick? I also think Timo Werner is a fine option. But for me, it probably goes Mount and Havertz and then down to Werner. So I would probably prioritize these two if you possibly can. Fixtures are obviously great. These aren't all green on the FDR rating. Of course, Manchester United isn't and Wolves isn't, but because they're in a double game week, I've basically just said all of these fixtures are great. Everton, Leeds and Watford is the singles and then West Ham United and Wolves and Leeds is the two doubles. I'm very happy starting my Chelsea players for all of these, assuming again that there isn't too much rotation. What I thought I'd do is I'm looking first at the season long data. So as you can see at the top of your screen, this is season long data for Mason Mount and Kai Havertz. I've then looked over the last five matches. So we're first going to go through season long and then we'll go through more recent because there's actually a switch in the data. And I think it's worth trying to pay attention to more recent switches. So projected points wise, uh, this is from FPL Review, the points projections. Mason Mount is just about projected to outscore Kai Havertz. But if you go through Fantasy Football Fix, Havertz is actually projected to come out on top. Expected FPL points so far over the season, Mason Mount's actually sitting at 7.1, which is really, really good for a 7.6 million pound midfielder. 7.1 is pushed into the likes of the premium players. It's 5.81 for Kai Havertz, which again, still isn't that bad. Non-penalty expected goal involvement is actually fairly comparable for the two. We're looking at 0.52 for Mason Mount and 0.45 for Kai Havertz. 
So both of them sitting at around an expected goal involvement every two games, assuming they play 90 minutes. That's not mind-blowing, but that is roughly what you would expect from a mid-price midfielder. Maybe a little bit on the low end, but as we'll see in a second, that has improved in recent weeks. Where Kai Havertz comes into his own is actually big chances per 90 and touches in the box per 90. So over the season, Kai Havertz is getting almost double the amount of big chances of Mason Mount, and it's worth noting Mount has taken a penalty too. And he's getting more touches in the box. So what this tells me is that Mason Mount is accumulating quite a good expected goal involvement through a lot of chances created and also some big chances as well. But generally speaking, they're sort of low accumulation of low XG shots and low XA chance creation. Whereas Kai Havertz is getting a lot of clear-cut opportunities. Almost a big chance every 90 minutes is quite a lot for Kai Havertz. And like I said, 6.31 touch in the box is ideal. It means he's getting into the box a lot and getting very involved. So this is over the season. I would say that this basically posits them right next to each other. I would say that they're very, very comparable just about because the non-penalty expected goal involvement is higher. I'd probably just about lean towards Mason Mount across the season. However, when we actually switch to the last five matches, so now on your screen is Mount versus Havertz over the last five, you can see number one, they've both been much, much better. So data's definitely improved for them over the last five. A lot of that is skewed by the Southampton game, of course, but still over the last five looking really good. But Havertz is now coming out on top quite significantly. So expected FPL points per 90 over the last five. Mounts at 9.23, just about on top. Kai Havertz at 9.11, I should say. So they're both almost 10 expected FPL points per 90, which is ridiculously good. Non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90. Mounts has actually improved from 0.52 to 0.61. Havertz has improved from 0.45 to 0.78. So Havertz has actually got a 0.67 expected goals per 90 over the last five, 0.11 expected assist. So Kai Havertz has been a massive goal threat recently. And you can see he's now got a 0.17 higher expected goal involvement per 90. Where it becomes absolutely ridiculous data over the last five, again, this is skewed by the Southampton game, but he, he did perform that way against Southampton and there have been other performances outside that. Big chances per 90. Mason Mounts is actually sitting around 0.46, which is very comparable to the entirety of the season. So what I would say before you get onto Havertz is that Mount is being very, very consistent. Kai Havertz has had 1.56 big chances per 90 over the last five. He's getting a big chance and a half every game, which is ridiculously good. It's not very sustainable. You don't see anyone sustain that across the season, but Kai Havertz does appear to be in quite a hot streak here. Touches in the box. Again, Mason Mount has improved to 4.15, but Kai Havertz is sitting at 8.44, which is level with the likes of Salah and Mane and Jota. So I guess across the season, fairly close just about Mount. More recently, it's got to be Havertz for me. And all this has said to me when I'm looking at this last five matches and looking at the fixtures to come, including a double game week, I want both Mount and Havertz. So like I said, I actually did start with double Chelsea defense and one Chelsea midfielder. I look at this data and even Ver Vernus has been excellent as well. We haven't discussed Vernus here, but I'm looking at maybe a double up on the Chelsea attack, probably Mount and Havertz, maybe one of the midfielders plus Werner. Let me know down below which Chelsea players are you targeting? Is it Mount? Is it Havertz? Are you going for both like me? Are you potentially taking the risk on Werner? Or are you more interested in like a Rudiger and James? or an Alonso and James in the defense? Let me know in the comments down below. So for those of you who are on your bench boost, or maybe you're not on your bench boost, but you just want to know who are the best cheap players moving forward, what I thought I'd cover is the best bench boost players for Game Week 36 bench boost and the best bench boost players for Game Week 37 bench boost. I've said bench boost far too many times. It's worth noting that some of these players you might not actually include on your bench. So to basically explain that, for example, if you have Dewsbury Hall or Gordon for game week 37, you might actually play them ahead of someone like a Saka or a Kulisevsky. So they might not actually be on your bench boost. But I think what people mean is, which cheap player should I include on my wildcard that improve my bench boost for 36 and 37? So even if these players aren't on your bench, they would still improve your team generally for those weeks. So actually, for the, for the large part, fairly similar. And something which I haven't spoken about a lot in my past videos... I'm about 99% set on a game with 36 bench boost, but if something changes for some reason, every wild card that I've put together for game with 36 bench boost probably works for a game with 37 bench boost as well. So again, a lot of these players you could pick for both because they double in both. So once again, Everton, Leicester, and Aston Villa, those three teams double in 36 and double in 37. So if you load up with cheap players from those teams, you can almost delay choosing if you want to if you want to bench boost in 36 or 37. So Pickford is probably the best keeper for both 36 and 37 as the cheapest 
player that doubles in both. You've then got defenders, Matty Cash, not very cheap. And again, you probably wouldn't bench, bench him, but I do like the fact that he doubles in both. And Fafana, the issue that I've got with Leicester, as I've said, is I'm not going to include someone like a Fafana on my wildcard personally, just because I don't trust. They've got four very good centre backs or four centre backs that they trust. Amati, Soyuncu, Evans and Fafana. They can just keep switching those back fours whenever they want around the Europa Conference League. So... He's probably the best cheap option, but at the same time, I don't expect him to start every game. And then you've essentially got the three perfect budget-enabling midfielders. I would definitely say it's worth having one of these on your wildcard. Yes, it takes up a, a valuable midfield spot, but they just offer such great value. So you've got Gordon Ramsay and Dewsbury Hall. I think all three of them are fantastic. For me, it's probably Gordon KDH. Not because I don't think Ramsey's good, but money is going to be very tight. No matter how good your team value is, money is going to probably going to be quite tight. And I think therefore I'd like to save with Gordon and KDH. I've still got Gordon. At, I bought him at 4.5. Obviously he's now 4.6 and KDH at the time of recording, this is 4.4, but it looks like he could go up in, in value soon. So I would try, if you're on your wildcard and you're watching this and KDH hasn't gone up yet, just buy him into your team just in case at 4.4. I think Gordon and Ramsey are absolutely fine as well. Where it then differentiates is basically there are some teams that also have a double in 36, but don't double in 37. And there are some that double in 37 and not in 36. So for 36, the five players that I think could be some good cheap options on your bench boost is basically Foster in goal. On all of my wild cards, I've got Schmeichel and Foster. I don't think Foster's great for 36 bench boost. I'm not, I'm not sure that I trust Everton and Pickford enough that it's worth paying the extra 0.7 million to go for Pickford over Foster in 36. So I've got Foster on most of my bench boosts. With respect to two decent cheap strikers that you could go for, Puki has been in every single one of my wild card drafts. I think Puki's absolutely fantastic value. Doubles in 36. You know he's going to start every game and he's on penalties. So I really like Puki, but he's of course not that cheap. I think he's 5.9 million Puki. Jao Pedro is a really, really good option. So I've just brought up his minutes alongside me because I know this probably has gone under the radar for a lot of people. Maybe I'm not giving you enough credit, but I didn't consider this until I started to look at the minutes. Jao Pedro has actually started five of the last six games and he started all four of the last games for Watford. So he's played 90 minutes, 77 minutes, 80 minutes and 83 minutes. The issue is that, of course, that could change at any given time. Puki, um, I should say Josh King could come back in. Obviously, they've got Dennis as well. Looks like Kucho Hernandez is out for the remainder of the season, though, which is valuable for Jao Pedro's minutes. So I actually think at the moment, if I do want a cheap striker, he's only 5.4 million. Jao Pedro could be a really decent option. And then under a similar vein with the Watford double being a decent double there, I've got Ismail Asar there if you want to go for someone like that in midfield and I've got Rafinha I probably wouldn't want either of these I think I'd rather just go for Gordon Ramsay and KDH but if you wanted a slight punt obviously Rafinha's on penalties you know he's going to start Saar could be a decent option but for me for a 36 bench boost most of my benches look something like Foster Jao Pedro Gordon and then one other player that's what it tends to look like for 37 the extra players are basically going to be majoritarily Crystal Palace players. So four of these players on this list are Crystal Palace players. And then Burnley also double as well. So Gaeta could be a really good option for a bench boost 37 goalkeeper. Mateta as a striker. I like Jay Rodriguez still. Still pretty cheap. Still a good option. He looks like he's going to continue to start. I think obviously gets on quite well with Ben Mee and all the management team that have come in. I think he'll continue to start alongside Valt Veghorst. So I actually think he's probably more nailed for minutes at the moment. Looks really good. And then you've got the two Palace centre-backs, Mark Gehi and, and Anderson as well. I think they're both good options for a bench boost too. So those are the players that I would be including. Basically, just look for cheap players that are getting a decent amount of minutes, okay underlying statistics that double in those two weeks. Let me know down below if you're bench boosting, what does your current bench boost for 36 or 37 look like? So what we have here is FPL reviews points projections over the next five game weeks ordered by the player that is projected to get the most points over the back end of the season. Of course, only five game weeks left now. So this is very useful and very accurate over long periods. So FPL review, they do track it. They have an accuracy rating. It is very, very good over long periods. The issue, like I said, with a five game week period is that it's such a small sample that you've got that anything can happen. If Mane scores five goals, you could say, well, why didn't they project Mane to score? Of course, that would, that would it wouldn't put it past him, but that's not likely to happen. So anything can happen in football. Take this with a pinch of salt, but I find it quite useful to look at. The top four players are Salah, Kane, Trent, and Son. Salah is quite clearly, so as you can see, 41.9 points he's projected to get. So this is why for me, when people are asking, are you sure it's worth going? I've got to go for Salah for me. I think he's the best captaincy option most weeks. His underlying data is still really strong. He's still on pens. Liverpool still have a lot to play for. For me, I'm not looking at anyone else as the main premium in my team. Interestingly, and we're going to get onto this, whilst Kane and Son are second and fourth on the FPL review algorithm, if you plug in a bench boost, optimal bench boost team for the future game week, so they build the optimal team based on underlying statistics and projections of minutes, Kane and Son aren't in any of those drafts for me. 
Now, the reason for that is because when you play a bench boost, they try and up the value on your bench slightly. When you don't plug in a bench boost, sometimes Son goes into there. Kane hasn't been in any when I've run these algorithms. The reason for that is, yes, Kane is projected to get quite a lot of points at 33, second on the list. And yes, Son is projected to get 32.6. But when you look at some of the other players, such as Havertz, Mount, Madison, Coutinho, Foden, lower down, they're very close in the projections for like £5 million cheaper. So as we're going to show you in a second when I get onto the drafts, some of mine, a lot of mine, almost all of mine don't include Son and Kane. That isn't me saying that I don't think Son and Kane will score a lot of points over the coming game weeks. In fact, I think they will. What it comes down to is can you get close to them whilst also upgrading your bench and improving other positions with the value that you would normally have in Son and Kane? Because with the two of them combined, you're looking at like 23, 24 million pound. Like that, that's seven, that's four or so, three or four sort of Mount and Foden's and Havertz. Like you can get a lot of value out some of the other options. So I could still end up going with Son. I think I've committed to no Kane. I just think he's too much value for me when I've got a bench boost in play. And like I said, just to read out some of the other options on this list, Robertson, Mount, Havertz, Madison, Cancelo, Foden, Coutinho, all in that sort of seven to eight million pound price bracket. There are so many good options that for me, I'm currently considering a one premium draft. Salah is my only premium. And then you can get in like Coutinho, Foden, Havertz, Mount. You can get in loads of these really good value players. It's a definitely a risky tactic. I wanted to present this to show you that Kane and Son are definitely high up there. But when you take into account everything else, and how close they are to some of the cheaper options, I do think you could potentially get away with neither of them. Let me know down below if you've considered going without Son and Kane. I do think that even if you're not going to go without them completely, I do think you should probably choose one and just back that one over the coming game weeks. I don't think it's personally worth investing in both. So just to bring all of that together before we look at four wildcard drafts, we've still got four wildcard drafts to come based on different sort of combinations of chips that you've got less than and some different structures of teams. What I thought I'd just bring together is what does the ideal wildcard include then? Based on what we've just said, what, does, what do I think is a good structure to start with? And again, this is all my opinion. I'm not perfect. I'm currently ranked 35K. I'm not winning FPL. So this is just my opinion on everything that I, I've done my research on. Of course, take all of it with a pinch of salt. I do also like the fact that I picked this graphic of Trent and I put him in and he's actually pointing directly at the top point. So the first point is six to nine players from Liverpool, City and Chelsea for me personally. I think you should be looking at probably, most of mine probably have seven. Most of mine are looking at two Liverpool, two City, three Chelsea, just because of the immediate Dublin 34. So I'm looking at about seven Chelsea, um, seven players. I think you could get away with a triple up on all of them. And I think you could probably get away with maybe two on each. You could probably get away with four or five from these. But I personally think, considering Liverpool and City are battling for the title, they've both got a double game week to come. Considering Chelsea have two double game weeks to come and some really good, valuable players... I think it's probably worth having six to nine from those. I then think I would fill up, if you're not free hitting on 30, in 36 or 37, I would have at least probably three or four players from Villa, Leicester and Everton. The reason again is it just saves transfers because you've got players that double in 36 and 37. If you're free hitting in one of those two, I think it's less essential that you go for these combinations, but I still think these players are still good. They still have good doubles in both weeks. Number three is try and make sure that you've got one of the top two captaincy options every single week. Now, this is the reason for me that I'm currently looking at only Salah as the only premium in my team, because I don't think necessarily Salah is the best captaincy option every week, but even in the weeks where he's not the best captaincy option, I'd put him in the top two, minimum top three. So when I look at other premiums like a Kane, if I'm not necessarily needing to captain Kane, if I'm happy captaining Salah, do I need to pay 12 plus 12.4 12 million pound for Kane if I'm not going to necessarily want to captain him? So I, I think make sure you've got your captaincy covered. If you think, like, for example, one of the reasons that I've got Coutinho in a lot of my drafts is because I think Coutinho is arguably the best game week 37 captain with the double that they've got, with the fact that Liverpool have a single, with the fact that if City don't double in 37, double in 36, I think Coutinho is the best captain. If City do double in 37, you've got to start to think, can you get KDB into your team? But these are the things you should be thinking about. Point four is players with excellent value need to be in your team right? Gordon and KDH stand out to me personally. I look at those two and think for 4.6 and 4.4 million pound respectively, they are fantastic value. Yes, it takes up a valuable midfielder spot, but they're putting up underlying statistics close to some sort of premium price defenders. Not that far off the likes of sort of 7.7, 7 to 7.5 million pound midfielders as well. So I think the both of them could be very good value, especially when they double in 36 and 37. So do try and get as many sort of high value players that aren't actually that expensive in your team. And then point five is maybe just be careful. And I realized I was doing this when I built my drafts. It's very exciting, the players that we've got to choose from. James Cancelo, Alonso, Havertz, Mount, Foden, Werner, Mares, all of these players you can see on your screen. The issue is that 
they are all rotation risks. Now, what I would say is it's very unlikely that all of them will miss out in a given week. But what you've got to consider is what happens if 80% of your rotation risks miss out in a given week. So if you've got eight rotation risks and something like, I don't know, like six of those miss out, you're going to be in real trouble, of course. So I would probably try and limit it to four serious rotation risks if you can. So as an example, if you went with Foden, Mount, Alonso, and James... I wouldn't also go for some other rotation risks like Jao Pedro, like like Mateta, because then you're going to start to get to a point where you could be on a bench boost 36 or bench boost 37, and, and some of your players might not even play altogether. So I would be a little bit careful because a lot of the players that we're targeting are quite big rotation risks. So bringing everything we've discussed together so far, let's now look at four wildcard drafts. I'll talk through them each individually. Each have either a different kind of structure that I think will be worth including, or they are targeted at a specific type of chip strategy. Right, guys, so the first two drafts, 1A and 1B, are basically my drafts at the moment. So what I thought I'd start with is what I'm currently liking, but what I'm going to say is I'm I'm realizing quite quickly that this isn't going to be very popular in the community. Similarly to my free hit, picking Ronaldo and Bruno over Son and Kane, people aren't going to like me dropping Son and Kane. Hopefully I did a decent job of discussing that in the projections, but in case you've just skipped this section... I'll go over it a couple more times as to why I am personally looking at it. We'll go through this draft. But like I said, 1A and 1B are slight variations on what I am really liking at the moment. Then 2 and 3 and 4 are going to be slightly more different. So I think we've actually maybe got five different drafts here. But I'll show you some different styles if you don't like this option. So these are actually one premium drafts. By one premium, I mean one sort of expensive player, that being Salah, with a bench boost 36 in mind. So this is very specific for me that I need to bench boost. When you don't need to bench boost, I would say if you don't need to bench boost, I would be going for a two premium draft at minimum. I think two premium drafts tend to be better because they're more flexible. If Son and Kane continue to absolutely smash it, if De Bruyne looks fantastic, if Ronaldo and Bruno suddenly start picking up form... If Mane suddenly becomes an amazing option for the back end of the season, it could be that I start to wish I had a structure where I could easily get to another. The issue I have here is other if other premiums start banging in the goals, I can't really get there. And if I want KDB for game week 37, again, it's going to be quite tricky to get there because I've spread the funds a little bit more. The reason that I've currently not got Son and Kane, even after having said all of that, is because I need to bench boost, I need to have a decent enough bench. And I also think there are so many good, like... I'm talking pretty much every player I want is between 7 million and and 8 million. It's right in that bracket, even the defenders, the strikers, the midfielders. And you can get quite a few of those if you drop out the other premiums in your team. So at the moment, I'm quite liking just Salah as the premium draft. So this is draft 1A. This draft's actually got double Chelsea defense as opposed to double Chelsea midfield. But as you can see, I've got Alonso, James, and Mount. I think if you're wildcarding 34, now that you know they've got the double, they've got a decent double in 36 as well, and they've got good fixtures, I think you've probably got to go for a triple up. You don't have to, but I would personally be looking at that. I've then got on the other side, triple Liverpool. So I've actually managed to get Trent, Robertson, and Salah. Like I said, I don't think Robertson's essential, but I do like him because he's 7.3 million. When you compare him to other 7 million-ish pound midfielders like Madison, even the likes of Coutinho and Richarlison, I think he'd probably get close to matching them if not doing better. So I do quite like him. Then smack bang in the middle of my defense, I've got Cancelo. You can see the two keepers, I've got a Schmeichel and Foster. I just think, like I said, for a bench boost 36, I think they make a lot of sense to me. Then the other midfielders outside of Mount and Salah are Kulisevsky and Coutinho. Now, I think you could probably go for Saka if you wanted to. I don't think Saka's a bad option to hold. But again, I'm looking at trying to get above and beyond what other people are doing and to try and gain some rank on the top 10K. I think Kulisevsky is a fine option. He's continuing to show good underlying data. And at least you're covering the Spurs attack a little bit, I guess. Coutinho, I love as an option. Like I said, Leicester and Norwich in the next two, double 36, double 37. And then you can transfer him out in game week 38. I think Coutinho could be an absolutely excellent option on the wild card. And then the striking options aren't actually that bad because I've dropped one of my premiums. If I don't drop a premium, if I have Son instead of Kulisevsky, the striking options, you have to go for like Gelhart, Mateta, Jao Pedro. They're not bad options. I really like the ones I've got though. So I've got Puki. Again, I think he's a great option starting against Newcastle here. Ignore the armband and the vice armband. And then I've got Watkins and Richarlison. Now, Watkins is really good... Like I said, similar reasons to Coutinho. Really like Watkins. Richarlison is great from 36 onwards. And for now, I can bench him. Like I said, great double in 36. Great double in 37. Decent fixture in 38. I think it's fine having Richarlison on a wild card as well. And it looks again like he is going to stay on penalties because he dispatched of the two most recent ones that he took. So I love this draft. I'll be honest. I think it's really good. The only difference that I'm currently planning on making, if I just show you it, for wild card 1B is I actually think I do prefer the double the double Chelsea midfield as opposed to the double Chelsea defence. The issue is that once you squeeze Havertz in, uh, instead of Kulisevsky, 
you then do have to drop Richarlison to João Pedro. Now, I'm pretty sure that's the only difference. So what you're essentially looking at in the, in the two, if you're trying to compare the two, is you're looking at Havertz and João Pedro versus Kulisevsky and Richarlison. The other thing that you can do to try and find some funds, this wouldn't be enough to get back up to Richarlison, but it would give you some money to play with, is like I said, I actually think one of the best back fours you can get is actually dropping Robertson for Laporte. So I have considered a very similar draft to this, but where I actually drop Robertson for Laporte and that gives me some extra money to play with in my team. So this is what I'm currently on, right? So I'll just I'll just flash back to, to that one, 1A and 1B. I'm looking at something close to these two. I'm probably actually leaning towards 1B at the moment because I think Mountain and Havertz could be great options. I've also looked at getting Werner in, but personally, I just think that Havertz amounts to slightly better options. Now let's move on to some slightly different style drafts because I know a lot of you are going to want Son and Kane into your team. So Wildcard 2 is actually the opposite end of, or I should say Wildcard 3, I guess, but 1A, one, 1B. One, one Wildcard 2 is the opposite end of the spectrum. This is actually a three premium draft and I don't have very good team value. So this means for those of you that were cracking, to, I've only got about 104.8 before having sold all of my players. Like some of you have got like 108 million. You could get a much better team than this. But this is essentially making quite a few downgrades in your attack, bench and defense to really pack out that midfield, which could be fantastic over the come, over the final five game weeks. This is with no bench boost left. I think if you've got a bench boost left, I do not think that three premiums are the way to go. Personally, I think if you've got a bench boost, you're either looking at a one premium draft or a two premium draft, unless again, you've got loads of money or you just want to go really cheap at the back. But I think those premium defenders are fantastic value. So we've still got Schmeichel and Foster here. Again, you could even drop Foster all the way down. You don't have to go for Schmeichel. He just doubles in 36 and 37. You could go for Pickford, go for Ramsdale. You could do whatever you want in the goalkeeping spot. As you can see, I've actually downgraded Cancelo and Trent to Robertson and Laporte. I don't really want to downgrade Trent, but for my team value to get three premiums in, I've had to. But I still think that's a really strong defense with Robertson, James and Laporte. The midfield is then Son, Salah, Mount, De Bruyne and Kulisevsky. So your three premiums are Son, Salah, De Bruyne, and you've still managed to get Mount and Kulisevsky in. So you're playing a really strong 3-5-2 almost every week. The issue is that the two strikers are going to have to be very cheap again. You're looking at Mateta and Puki or João Pedro and Puki. If you've got a little bit of funds, you could potentially try and stretch up to a Watkins or to a Richarlison. Like I said, I think they're two good options at that middle price. It could be that actually you say rather than a 3-5-2. I think I'll downgrade Kulisevsky to Gordon and I'll upgrade Mateta and try and get again up to a Watkins and I'll play like a 3-4-3 some weeks, but then you'd need to try and upgrade Gelhart as well. So it becomes quite tricky. I guess this is to say that three premiums is probably a bit of a stretch, but it's possible. If you really value those midfielders and you think, I think Son, Salah and De Bruyne are going to be absolutely cracking over the coming game weeks, then I do think you can get a three premium draft, but I don't think you can bench boost and get three premiums personally. But if you can do, let me know down below. So this is a three premium draft. Now let's just move on to what I would call the most balanced draft possible, where you can, add, you can bench boost or you could potentially leave the bench boost if you don't have that chip left. So I expect this to be the most popular wildcard, at least this sort of structure. I should say that I haven't included any with a premium striker. Now, it's not because I don't think Kane's a good option, and I do like the option of starting with Ronaldo in 34 and then switching to Kane. I just think there's such a lot of money. If I'm going to go for a premium Spurs player, I go for Son, and I don't really want to start with any Manchester United players, even though they do have a double. It's just not a very good double anyway. I'd probably fancy the other single game week players or triple Chelsea. So I think this is a, a good balance between having two premiums. So you've got Salah and Son in here still having a strong defense, still having strong players elsewhere, and actually you could bench boost this, or you could potentially strip the bench out a little bit and upgrade one of the other spots. So you've still got Schmeichel Foster. For now, I've just been using that, that double up. You could potentially change that. You've then got a really strong back four. Like I said, I think this is probably the ideal back four without spending too much money with Trent, James, Cancelo, and Laporte. So really strong back four. Then you've actually got enough money to go for someone like Ben White on the bench. You could downgrade that to a Ben Davies if you wanted to. You've got lots of different options. You've got around sort of 4.6, 4.7 if you've got a similar team value to me. Then you've got a very strong midfield four. Like I said, Salah and Son is your two premiums. Still getting a Chelsea def a Chelsea midfielder in there, Mount Havertz, whoever you want to go for. Then also getting someone like a Salah Saka or Kulisevsky. So you've got, again, around sort of 6.5 to 7 million pounds for that spot. You could potentially, if you've got the value stretch to Madison, if you want to go for a Leicester midfielder. For me, I don't really fancy the rotation for the time being at least. And then you've got two strong strikers in, in Watkins and Puki. Like I said, the strikers aren't great this year anyway, so why spend a lot of money on them? And then Jao Pedro on the bench. But if you're not bench boosting, 
Get Jao Pedro all the way down to Gelhart or to Greenwood, whoever you want from Leeds, one of the cheap Leeds uh, strikers. And then potentially you can upgrade elsewhere in the team. So I think this is probably the most balanced draft possible, which covers the potential for a bench boost in 36 or 37 if you wanted to. I know there are lots of other wildcards to cover, whether you're free in 36, free in 37, some for bench boost. That there are just too many drafts for me to cover. But hopefully these four drafts are, have given you a little th something to think about. Like I said, if I just switch back to this, this is at the moment my favorite because I'm bench boosting in 36 and because I think that spreading the value might be worthwhile for the back end of the season personally. But I think that this is the more balanced one. Right, so I'll just switch between them two again. There's not that much of a difference between them. Realistically, the, the major difference is rather, I'll just switch again. Essentially, it's the Son is down to Havertz for me. So you're switching Son down to a Chelsea midfielder. Allows you to get Robertson into the defense. And it also allows you to upgrade one of your other strikers as well. I just think that Mount will get, cl uh, this might be a silly thing to say. I think Mount and Havertz will get close enough to Son. I think Son will outscore them but I don't know if he'll outscore them by four million pound-ish. So let me know down below, what do you think of my wildcard drafts? I've given this a fair bit of thought already, so hopefully that shows, but I'm going to continue to think throughout the week. Later on in the week, you will have my wildcard team selection video. We'll also have a live stream. I think we're going to live stream on Wednesday this week. So there's going to be plenty of content where I'll top up what I'm thinking. I'm sure I'll change these throughout the week, but as always, let me know your wildcard drafts down below. So guys, there you have it. That is my complete Game Week 34 wildcard guide. Hopefully going to help you out for the back end of the season, even if you're not wildcarding. By the way, if you've watched the entire thing and you're not wildcarding, let me know down below that you've watched it and you're not wildcarding. But it should have still been useful because we're talking about players to target for the back end of the season. I think this will be a useful video for anyone. If you did enjoy the video and you're enjoying the content on this channel, please do make sure to drop a like, drop a comment down below and also subscribe to the channel as well. We did recently hit 13,000 subscribers on our recent charity live stream. So thank you very much. If you are one of the new subscribers or if you're an OG of the channel, I appreciate you either way and do look out for the content later on in this week and hopefully you have a good end to game week 33 which is still ongoing at the time of me recording this thank you very much for watching cheers bye bye